Hey everybody, my name is Kim Siever. Welcome back to my channel. In January, the International Order of Oddfellows Lethbridge Chapter hosted their annual speech competition. One of the entries was one of the children of Hunter Hagee, the owner of King of Trade, pawn shop in downtown Lethbridge. The topic of her speech was the drug crisis. Her mother recorded this speech and uploaded a video of it to Facebook, which had started to make the rounds, receiving dozens of reactions and shares. It contains some misinformation, so I thought I'd do a response video. The response video will be a bit different than some of my other response videos. This speaker isn't a journalist or a politician, so I'm not going to hold her to the same standard as I did the others I responded to. I think her intent was good overall, but her speech lacked research, structure, and her intended objectivity. That's what I intend to address. Just a heads up, like all my response videos, this video will be longer than my typical videos. Here we go. Good evening. My name is Addison Hagee. I'm 15 years old and go to LCI in Lethbridge, Alberta, Canada. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. Today I would like to speak on a crisis that affects our entire world and has greatly impacted my city in a negative way, the opioid crisis. It is an incredibly complex issue with many opinions and perspectives. Tonight, I would like to share some of these perspectives and propose some solutions. Okay, so this seems to be off to a good start. If you're just watching this video for the first time, it shows promise. Please remember her promise to propose solutions. We'll come back to that later. Communities throughout the world have tried countless approaches to drug addiction. The solution that has shown the best results to, to drug addiction so far has been the four pillar approach. This approach integrates four pillars of health, prevention, recovery and rehabilitation, law enforcement and justice, and harm reduction. This is true, although the Canadian government has a slightly different wording and order. Prevention, treatment, harm reduction, and enforcement. Let me explain each of these pillars. The first pillar is prevention. Prevention comes from education and dealing with the root causes of substance abuse. It is easier to help people before they become addicted to a toxic substance. Once they are addicted, the other pillars need to be used. The second pillar is recovery and rehabilitation. Recovery and rehabilitation refers to acting to improve physical and emotional well-being of people who use or have used substances. Treatment and detox are part of recovery and rehabilitation. The third pillar is enforcement and justice. Enforcement and justice refers to acting to strengthen community safety by responding to crime caused by substance use, including police and courts. The fourth pillar is the harm reduction pillar. The harm reduction pillar refers to implementing programs that aim to reduce, to reduce the consequences of substance use and can include abstinence from substances. Again, this seems mostly fine. This could also be a supervised consumption site or an SES for short. This is an odd wording. It implies that supervised consumption sites are exceptions to the programs she mentioned that aim to reduce the consequences of substance use. These are facilities where addicts are watched over by registered nurses while they inject or inhale drugs. Where I live, our community has only implemented one pillar, the harm reduction pillar. This just isn't true. At the very least, we have a second pillar, enforcement. And that was in place decades before the SCS opened. Even so, our community implemented harm reduction first only because other pillars are outside the jurisdiction of the municipal government and the governments were dragging their feet on prevention and treatment programs in our community. They still are. And people were dying. They were consuming drugs in public. There was drug debris all over the place. Something needed to be done. And no one was willing to do it. Not the municipal government, not the provincial government, not the federal government. Nothing outside of hiring more cops. Lethbridge opened an FCS facility. This is normally the last pillar to be put in place, but in our city, we opened it first. This doesn't even make sense. Why would harm reduction be the last thing to be put in place? It takes time to re seek treatment, and harm reduction keeps people alive until they can get treatment. And it reduces the harm to the general community. Leaving it to last is just a recipe for disaster. The lack of a proper plan has caused serious negative consequences throughout the area. 
This is misleading. Significant comprehensive planning went into its establishment. Over a year before the SES opened, the following 16 organizations got together and formed the Coalition on Opioid Use. Alberta Health Services, Alberta Children's Services, Alberta Justice and Solicitor General, Arches, Canadian Mental Association, City of Lethbridge, Holy Spirit Catholic Schools, Lethbridge College, Downtown Lethbridge BRZ, Lethbridge Fire and Emergency Services, Lethbridge Police Service, Lethbridge Public Library, Lethbridge School School District Number 51, Kotoki Friendship Center, Social Housing in Action, University of Lethbridge. This coalition met monthly. They also formed six working groups, harm reduction, prevention education, treatment outreach, communications, care support, and research evaluation, which met outside of monthly meetings. In May 2017, coalition representatives from Alberta Health Services, Lethbridge Fire and Emergency Services, Lethbridge Police Service, and Arches presented their six-month progress. Council was made aware of the increasing crime, increasing overdoses, and increasing addiction rates, and the coalition was in the process of a preliminary community needs assessment to determine whether a supervised consumption site with comprehensive in-house support services would be an effective way to deal with the crisis effect in Lethbridge. As part of that needs assessment, the coalition conducted a feasibility study with 25 key leaders in the community. They also held targeted information sessions with community and service groups, faith communities, and business collectives. In addition, they hosted several information sessions for the following groups. City of Lethbridge Mayor and Council, twice. Lethbridge Police Service to 130 officers during eight roll call training in services. Member of Parliament Rachel Harder, Regional Lethbridge Better Business Breakfast Club, the Rotary Club of Lethbridge, Associate Minister of Health Brandy Payne, City of Lethbridge Planning and Development, Methadone Clinics, Lethbridge Fire and Emergency Services, 50 personnel during four training in services, Alberta Community Corrections, 10 probation officers, and local print, radio, and television media. Finally, they also conducted a drug use and health survey with over 200 people who used drugs. The following month, the 16-member coalition finished the needs assessment, which included studying community addiction strategies from multiple countries. The assessment concluded that Lethbridge could benefit benefit from a supervised consumption site. Also in June, the coalition held stakeholder sessions with law enforcement, emergency medical responders, corrections, and others. In July, they hosted community discussion sessions for the broader Lethbridge public at the following locations. Crossings Library Branch twice, Lethbridge College twice, Alberta Health Services three times, City Hall, Boys and Girls Club. Over 100 people attended the community sessions and had opportunity to ask questions and provide feedback. Concurrently with the stakeholder and community sessions, the coalition posted an online survey open to the public, keeping it up for about a month to receive feedback on a potential supervised consumption site. A link was provided on the city website on Arches' Facebook page, through Arches' mailing list, and pamphlets left at community discussion sessions and handed out on the street by Arches staff and volunteers. Plus, various groups, people, and organizations shared the link to the survey on social media. Over 220 people responded. They also publicized an email address where people can send their feedback. With the assessment complete and significant community consultation, the coalition proceeded to the application stage, and Arches applied to Health Canada on the coalition's behalf at the end of July. As part of the application process, the coalition posted an ad in the Lethbridge Herald, which was required by Health Canada, to which people could submit feedback. How anyone can think there wasn't enough planning or that process proper planning never took place is beyond me. Here are just some of the terrible side effects that we have experienced in Lethbridge. People are scared to shop or attend appointments at businesses near the SES. Okay, but that's not really anything the SES can do something about. I've lived here for 22 years and the entire time people have complained about downtown, how they are scared to shop downtown or attend appointments downtown. The activity or situations that people are scared of are not new. It's just that some of those activities and situations are now occurring in the Upper East Side, but they were occurring before the SES opened. And while I don't want to delegitimize people's fear, because fear is a real emotion people experience, I think it's important for those fears to be framed framed in some context. On the 20th of January 2020, Dr. M. Peel, an assistant professor in the University of Lethbridge Faculty of Health Sciences, presented her Urban Social Issues Study to City Council. Her study measured perception of so-called social disorder by people within 100 meters of the SCS, within 500 meters of the SCS, and within the area of downtown proper. One of the findings of the study was that while perception of social disorder had increased within 100 meters of the SCS, it had also increased within 500 meters of the SDS as well as downtown. Also, the activity that was most often reported by survey respondents was loitering, just 
standing around. As well, pretty high were sleeping in public, being drunk, and doing drugs. Um, again, while fear is a real thing, none of these activities are endangering to passersby. So one might ask what the fear is based on, if not danger. They, this has had a tremendous impact with many businesses moving or reducing staff due to lack of customers. Some businesses have even been forced to close. I'd love to see concrete evidence of this. I'd love to see some data showing the rate of business closure prior to the SCS opening compared to since the SCS open. I'd also love to compare that to the rate of businesses opening before after the SCS open because I can think of a handful of businesses that have opened in the area since the SCS open. Companies and factories with all the jobs they create are hesitant to move to close or even close to the SCS or even to my city. This just isn't true. Since the beginning of 2018, around the time when the SCS opened, the City of Lethbridge issued 61 permits for new construction for commercial, industrial, and institutional uses. In the same period, they issued 374 permits for renovations for the same uses. For example, the Cavendish Farms project alone, the largest private investment in Lethbridge's history, opened last year. Clearly, some businesses are opening or expanding in Lethbridge. The impact on our overall economy has been staggering. How so? The December 2019 unemployment rate for the Lethbridge Medicine Hat region was 4.0, the lowest it's been since 2014. Likewise, the Conference Board of Canada reported that GDP for the Lethbridge region grew by 5.1% in 2018, the year the SES opened, and while their 2020 report hasn't been released yet, their most recent report predicted GDP growth of 2.6% for the region for 2019, boosted by activity in the manufacturing, construction, and primary and utility sectors. Plus, a recent survey co-sponsored by Economic Development Lethbridge and the Lethbridge Chamber of Commerce found that of the 143 businesses surveyed, over 75% are upbeat about the overall health of their businesses. More specifically, over 40% expect to be busier this year. Another 40% expect to increase operational spending this year. A third plan to make capital investments this year. And half plan to hire more workers. As well, according to the release that accompanied the survey, 59 new businesses opened up in Lethbridge since 2017 with the strongest growth occurring among mid-sized businesses. Crime has increased dramatically. Crime has indeed increased in Lethbridge, but I'm not sure I'd say dramatically. The Crime Severity Index for the Lethbridge region in 2018 was 158.68, the highest it's been since 1999. The CSI for 2019 has yet to be released. However, we must remember that this index has been increasing in Lethbridge since 2014. For example, the CSI for 2018 increased by 13.05% over 2017, and while that seems like a lot, it went up by 13.42% in 2017. 2015, 15.94% in 2017, and 24.35% in 2014. Since the CSI started rising in 2014, the 2018 rise was the second lowest increase. If the SES is causing crime to go up, we should see the 2018 CSI increasing dramatically, not slowing. There has been lots of breaking and entering into homes and garages. This is sort of true. Again, 2019 stats aren't available, but there were 858 reported break in enters in 2018 compared to 747 in 2017. And while that's certainly higher, it didn't increase as quickly as it has in other years. The 2018 number was 12.34% higher than it was in 2017, but the 2017 number was 26% higher than it was since 2016. And 2015's was 45.34% higher than it was in 2014. 14. Break-in and enters have been increasing for at least five years, but the rated increase in 2018 has slowed. If the SCS was causing more break-in and enters, the rate at which they increased should have gone up. Stolen property has skyrocketed, and there has been a number of assaults. Same goes for stolen property. The increase in the number of reported incidents of theft under $5,000 for 2018 was the slowest increase for, of the five years starting with 2014. Theft over $5,000 actually decreased in 2018, the only decrease in the same five-year period. As far as assaults go, there have been, to use Addison's language, a number of assaults every year during the same period. Perhaps he meant that assaults have increased. While it's true that the number of level one assaults increased in 2018 compared to other years, and is at its highest rate, the number of aggravated assaults decreased in 2018 over 2017 by over 50%, the largest decrease in that five-year period. A lack of proper enforcement and criminal prosecution 
has only added to the problem. I'm not sure what this means. What does proper enforcement mean? And is she saying that there's been no criminal prosecution? Because that's simply not true. Not only is my home city experiencing economic problems, but we are also experiencing a social crisis. Needles have been found in school playgrounds, parks, and alleys all over the city. Okay, but discarded needles existed in public prior to the SCS opening. Even so, Arches Needle Collection Program picks up 83% more needles now than they did prior to the SCS opening. Plus, because hundreds of thousands of instances of drug usage occur inside the SCS, Arches doesn't need to distribute as many needles. In fact, they're distributing 70% fewer needles than they were prior to the SCS opening. So with fewer needles being distributed and more needles being picked up, the number of discarded needles in public is actually down. Multiple people, mostly kids, have been pricked by needles and gotten very sick. The number of people reported being pricked is extremely low in the single digits. Even if we say it's 10 and it's not, that's 0.01% of the population. And not one of them has become sick because of being pricked. Actually, a 2015 study that analyzed 1,500 cases around the world of needle stick injuries discovered that only five ended up in an infection. That's an infection rate of 0.3%. In other words, for one person to be infected at that rate, over 300 would need to be pricked. And we're nowhere close to that. And thanks to the fewer needles in the community, it's unlikely we will be for a long time. Many people from Lethbridge are losing their loved ones due to overdosing. It is hard to find a person who doesn't know someone affected by addiction. Okay, but that's not because of the SCS. If anything, there are fewer overdose deaths in Lethbridge because the SCS exists. In the nearly two years since its opening, the SCS has seen over 3,100 medical emergencies, including overdoses. Not a single one of them has resulted in death. If people are dying from overdose in Lethbridge, it's not because of the SCS. The SCS in Lethbridge opened in March 2018. February. And averages 663 visits per day. To put that in perspective, that's more daily visits than the sites in Toronto, a city of more than 2 million. In fact, the Lethbridge SES is the busiest injection site in the world, and our city is only 100,000 people. The SCS saw 373,956 visits between 28th of February 2018 and 31st December 2019, which is 670 days. That brings us to 558 visits per day, not 663. Regardless, that's a good thing. Assuming all those visits were for drug consumption, that's over 370,000 instances of drug use that didn't happen in public, that happened under the watch of medically trained professionals, which is why none of the 3,130 medical emergencies ended in death. That's tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of needles that were safely disposed of. That's tens of thousands of needles that were never shared, reducing transmission rates of infectious diseases. Being the busiest consumption site in the world, although I'm not sure it's been established as the busiest in the world, certainly North America, is not a bad thing. Our community lacks sufficient treatment services and capacity until we get it, keeping people alive, reducing infection rates, and keeping communities safe is a good thing. When addicts use the SCS, they are only given the option of using. Yes, the point of a consumption site is consumption. Even so, as of December 2019, Arches staff had made over 9,000 referrals to external service providers and over 11,000 referrals to detox and treatment. So it's not like using is the only option, at least not strictly speaking. Detox and treatment services don't occur on site, true, but SCS staff can still refer clients to facilities who do offer such services. If they want to check into a rehab facility, the wait can be months. To an opioid addict, hours without the drug feels like years. A month is almost impossible for them to go without help. Okay, but that isn't the fault of the SCS. If people are concerned with the accessibility of treatment services, they should be petitioning the provincial government, which funds such medical services, rather than criticizing and opposing the most comprehensive non-enforcement service provided in the city to help combat the drug crisis. If they are only given the choice of doing drugs, that's is what they will choose. Using drugs isn't a choice. That's not how addiction works. When you are addicted, your body forces you to use the substance it's addicted to. You don't just will it away. For people addicted to smoking, for example, 95 to 97 percent will fail if they try quitting cold turkey. Rehab needs to be a realistic alternative. 
Agreed, treatment service needs to be available on Lethbridge. And people need to devote the time they spend criticizing the SES to petitioning the provincial government for more treatment services. Further, the addicts are allowed to leave the site with needles provided by the SES. When addicts are given the agency to leave and inject the drug, they have a chance of overdosing. True, but what do you suggest they do? Force them to stay? They just won't come back. And they'll get their needles from somewhere else. Stealing them. Reusing them. Stealing to get money to buy them. Using makeshift needles, etc. At least this way they have clean needles, which reduces risk to the public and mitigates disease transmission risk. If they are by themselves or even with some friends, they might not be able to save themselves in time if they overdose. But if they have to stay in the site with the needle, the supervisors can inject an overdose or reversal drug called Meloxin and call 911 to notify an ambulance. Again, forcing them to stay won't improve the situation. They'll stop coming back, and their situation will actually worsen because they'll be using unsafe practices while consuming drugs. But I'm glad that you find the SCS serves a purpose in the community. This brings up a further problem. Our hospitals and emergency rooms are overcrowded with users making it so that if you went to the emergency room, you might not be able to get the help that is needed. This isn't true. The first two quarters of 2019, the last two quarters don't have data available yet. Emergency room visits related to opioid usage was down compared to the first two quarters of 2018. In the second quarter, again, the most recent data available, Lethbridge had under 250 people during the entire quarter, which was below the provincial average. If we round that up to 250 and we multiply it by four, we get about a thousand a year. That's not even three visits per day. That's hardly overcrowding. Besides, remember, the SCS has seen over 3,000 medical emergencies, the vast majority of which never are transferred to the hospital. The SES reduces demand on hospital services and emergency departments. The end result is out of control health care costs and a lack of service. The SES is not driving up healthcare costs. It's reducing them. Every emergency department visit the SES prevents saves Alberta Health Services $200. If we multiply $200 by 3100, we get over $610,000. The SES potentially saved AHS over half a million dollars in the two years it's been open. If healthcare costs are out of control, it's not because of the SES. Lethbridge is trying to deal with these problems by in implementing the other three pillars. Prevention programs in schools and at community facilities are just beginning. They have hired additional police and peace officers to bolster enforcement. The worst offenders of the laws, of the laws are slowly being removed from the streets. Rehab and detox facilities are in the planning stages and governments have committed funds to these projects. I don't think this is quite true, at least not for Lethbridge. Jason Kenney did promise in September to fund 4,000 treatment spaces, but that's for the entire province, and there's no guarantee that Lethbridge will get the number of space it needs, let alone any spaces at all. As well, only a portion of the money will go towards treatment beds. Also, at $80 million for all 4,000, that's only $20,000 per space, so it remains to be seen how effective the spaces will be. People are beginning to feel safer. This will be a long process, but we have to fight the battle. The opioid crisis is a very difficult subject that involves many points of view. Through an addict's eyes, they see the SCS facility as a place, as a safe haven where they can relieve their pain and have friends that can relate to them. For the addict's loved ones, they want what's best for them, but can't seem to get the help that is needed. I've seen this point of view for myself as I have recently lost an uncle to addiction and an overdose. It is heartbreaking and a huge reason why I'm so passionate about this epidemic. Through the point of view of the regular citizens, they are scared that they might, that they, they might get hurt, or worse, their family might get harmed. It has gotten so bad in some parts of the city that parents are lining up before soccer games and checking the, checking the field for needles. As I already pointed out, there are fewer discarded needles in public than there were before the SCS opened. So it seems odd to say it's gotten so bad that people check fields for needles now, but didn't when there were more needles out in public. It's about safety. And yet another perspective is from the business and property owners. They don't like the SCS because 
it drives customers away. Okay, but I've already pointed out that the majority of reported behavior that business owners and their clients find objectionable are no threat to their safety. It's one thing to no longer shop in the area out of fear, even if it's misplaced, but to say it's for safety is disingenuous. My parents own a business downtown, so I've been able to see the effects that the site has had on business owners firsthand. My dad's store had to lay off five employees because business had been slower due to the injection site. These employees are good people with families to provide for. Your dad's store is over seven blocks away from the SCS. It's unlikely that the SCS has directly affected his business. Even so, I'd love to see the evidence that business is slower in a pawn shop because a supervised consumption site exists. As you can see, this topic is very divisive, but there are a few things we all can agree on. We want to be able to help those who suffer from addiction by getting them the support they need. We want to walk around our cities and feel safe. We want to be able to leave our garage door open for a few minutes without getting robbed. We, and most important of all, we all want our children and grandchildren to grow up in a safe and secure environment. We want them to be able to go outside and play baseball with their friends without, worry, without having to worry about stepping on a needle. I believe that if we implement the four pillars of health, prevention, recovery and rehabilitation, law enforcement and justice, and harm reduction, in the proper order, we'll be able to solve the opioid crisis in my, not just in my city, but throughout the entire world. Thank you. Okay, but where are the solutions you promised to propose at the beginning of your speech? You certainly provided several perspectives, but you promised solutions. It didn't share any. I've said this many times before, and I'll say it again here. The supervised consumption site saves lives. It makes our community safer. It saves our healthcare system money. It takes burden off paramedics. Plus, although it's difficult to attribute this to the SES, local crime is increasing at one of the lowest rates of the current five-year crime wave. Our community is in a better condition socially than we were two years ago. That is what the data shows. And it's surprising that others continue to deny this, that there are others who still insist on putting ideology before facts. Thanks for watching. Thanks to all these subscribers and Patreon patrons who make this video possible. You can follow me online at siever.ca slash Kim. I'm also on Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr. If you appreciate the videos I share on YouTube, the posts I write on my blog, and the content I share on my other social media accounts, please consider making a monthly donation either through PayPal or Patreon. If you agree with the points I raise in my video, please give me a thumbs up and let me know in the comments below why. Please share my video and subscribe to my channel. Please also click on the notification bell so you receive notifications whenever I upload a new video. I look forward to talking to you again soon.